From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Barris here. And I'll tell you what, this is our first live show now, I believe, of the new year. I, I'd been off for a while, and yesterday we didn't have a program, but we got one going for you today on this Wednesday. And it's great because we've got one of my favorite guests this morning, and it's a good way to kick off the new year. To take your phone calls if you want to join in the conversation as we're talking about malpractice law. And I'm curious, too, about any of the changes that may be coming down to the laws as well as it applies to you, the patient, what you can and cannot do in court if you feel you've been wronged by a doctor. And with that, malpractice attorney Clint Kelly's with us. Good Happy morning. New Year. Happy New Year to yeah. you, my friend. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you. Uh, back in the saddle, this is the first, this sets the tone for the rest of the darn year. Okay, so we're at the peak here. This we, better be a good show. Well, it, it always is. Yeah. Last time you were on, we had a lot of phone calls. Um, I don't know, the new year as it gets rolling, we may get some more this morning, maybe not. The phone lines are going to be open. Seven three seven seven five eight seven. Real quickly, just uh, again, uh, you are you specialize in malpractice law, right? And uh, again, um, whether or not you sitting at home think you may have a case, what are the questions someone needs to ask themselves again? Uh, bad medical mistake that causes a bad medical injury. If you've got those two things, then you have a potential claim that's worth investigating. Okay, but a, a negative result from some kind of medical treatment unto itself is not. That's correct. We, I mean, doctors aren't miracle workers. We, we refer to that as a, simply a bad outcome. If the bad outcome is not the product of medical negligence, then there is no case. Okay. Um, and again, um, I'd like to hit these points with him always at the beginning. It's important if you suspect something happening, make the call, and we're going to have his number up before the end of the program because of statute of limitations. That's correct. You have in Tennessee one year from the date that you discover your injury to file what's called pre-suit notice. If you don't do that, your claim can be barred forever. So if you want to maintain your right to bring a lawsuit, you need to make sure you call and have your claim evaluated as soon as you think something wrong has happened. Okay. All right. Uh, anything on the radar for you right now? I mean, is uh, we want to throw things out uh, to folks maybe to think about or changes in the law? I know yeah. there's things you like to talk about. Well, there is, and I brought this up with okay. you off camera. You know, anytime the legislation legislature is in session, there's no saying, you know, guard your wallet. Right. Uh, one of the proposed bills, and this was reported online yesterday, that keeps cropping up every every year, is a bill called Patients for Fair Compensation, Patience. which is a, in essence, it's a bill proposed by a man named Jackson who owns a healthcare staffing company. What he wants to do is to create, in essence, a workers' comp system in medical malpractice cases where you would not have courts anymore. You would have doctors deciding whether the case is meritorious and doctors deciding what type of compensation the patient would get under the circumstances. For a malpractice? For malpractice. You know, I, it, I, they come up with a cute name like patients for fair well, yeah, compensation, that sounds, right. which you know, to me is like foxes for safe hen houses. It's, <laughs> it, you know, a lot of people, you know, the Affordable right. Care Act, a lot of people would say it, that's not exactly what it's been. Uh, what this is, is an attempt to create a bureaucracy to take over medical negligence cases. Now, I don't think it's going to happen because two principal reasons. First of all, it does not work. It's never worked in the United States, and I don't believe it would work here. Secondly, there's a big constitutional problem because we all have a right to jury trial in cases like this, and you would have to pass a constitutional amendment for this to, to become law. But I'm going to talk about this from time to time as we have these shows, and I, and I want to make sure the public understands it. They say, well, as a trial lawyer, of course, he's going to be against any kind of change to the law that's going to put you know, courts out of, right. out of business. The doctors are also against this. The doctors' insurance companies are against this. If you go online, they've tried this in Georgia. The Georgia Medical Association came out against it. The Florida Medical <coughs> Association came out against it in Florida. I would expect the same thing to happen here in Tennessee. And one of the principal reasons is we have a fairly small number of claims now that are in the system. You and I talk about this right. all the time. There's been a tremendous decrease in the number of claims, a lot of reasons for it. But that's, you know, in essence, a good thing for the doctors. This will create a huge floodgate of claims. Anything from just a cut on the hand to a lacerated spleen, you name it. And that's what happened to workers' comp. Workers' comp was designed to contain costs right. by reducing the number of lawsuits in court. Now we have more workers' comp claims than we've ever had in an administrative system. And it's just really a, a large bureaucracy in the Department of Labor. So 
I always tell people that this is one of those times you get on the phone, you call your senator or your legislator and you say, look, I've heard about this patient's fair compensation bill. I do not want malpractice claims farmed out of the courts. Just say, but yeah, no. so essentially what it would mean for someone who, who was wronged baby, by a doctor, instead of being able to hire an attorney Correct. and sue them to then have a judge or a jury determine what the damages are, it doesn't, it would not go to, they would not have a right to sue, which again, I know is a constitutional issue, I don't tell you how that would work, but instead it would go to a panel of doctors who would look and say, okay, he left a sponge in the guy's chest after surgery, um, what's it worth? Yeah, the, the government would create, in <coughs> essence, a review panel, and this would all be, this would all be selected by the government, and this review panel would first be responsible for assigning doctors to look at the claims to determine whether the claim has merit. Who knows how long it would take for the doctors to make that decision. There's no ability to present evidence at these. This is merely the doctors looking at the claim and deciding on their own. Right. If and only if the claim has merit, then does the claim go to another body, government appointed, who makes a decision what the claim is worth. And it's based on a schedule like workers' comp is. Who knows how long that takes place. And again, there's no ability to have a hearing or put on evidence. It's just basically what these people think. Then and only then would the patient, if they're dissatisfied with the result, have the opportunity to go to what's called an administrative law judge, yet another government appointee, just a, a person, who looks at this and decides whether or not the process was followed fairly. There's no right of appeal. There's no ability to get into the court system. So basically all of these people's cases get thrown into a bureaucracy and this bureaucracy makes the decision whether or not people get compensated. You lose the power of the courts, you lose the power to bring a case in essence. Amazing, amazing. All right, I mean, I, the bottom line on this, I'm trying to get a handle on how many malpractice cases, legitimate ones you think, that are taken on by you know specialized attorneys like yourself every year in Tennessee. I mean, any idea? We're, we're in the hundreds. We're All right, the, but hundreds, I'm not, yeah. not thousands. Hundreds. We have what seven, eight million people in this state, okay. and that content consistently increases. And we have hundreds of malpractice cases. Think of that small minority, and you get two guys like this that come in and, and basically buy a senator or buy a house representative to propose this legislation. You have to ask yourself, what is the motive? Why, right. why is this being pursued? Well, this man who is lobbying for this bill has a health care staffing company. He wants to staff the bureaucracy. That's where the money is. I see. Okay, and that's how it would change. But ultimately, in your opinion, the consumer would lose on that. Oh, huge. <coughs> look, look, like I said, look at workers' comp. I mean, that's just a classic you know, exhibit A of what happens when you take the courts out of a compensation system. And in this case, you allow people, not jurors, but people from healthcare make a decision whether someone's going to get paid. Okay. In addition to that, is there any other stuff that comes up every year on tort reform that you're, you've got your eye on? There probably will be. This was just the first thing that I noticed because it was reported in the media that you know, the, they actually had a comment from one of these lobbyists you know, talking about how much money would be saved right. in the healthcare system because of defensive medicine uh, that would be uh, reduced. And there is absolutely no evidence anywhere to support what this guy's saying. They just, you know, it, all you have to do is you go back and see what happened in Georgia and Florida, and you'll see why these bills died there and why I think it's and likely to die here. There. Okay. And then, like you said, there may be a constitutional issue against Huge the backdrop constitutional all issue. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Aside from all of that, um, I just want to, you know, viewers sitting out there right now, what are the predominantly the, the primary cases that you guys handle? When people come to you, I know you've, you've got, you, you and I have done stories on a broad range, all right, but is it back surgeries? Is it, is it uh, infections from hospitals? What are we seeing right now as being, you know, one of the predominant ones? Yeah, Nick, infections for sure, but also what I've noticed uh, recently are blood clots. All right. Uh, I read over the weekends, or not the weekend, a couple weekends ago over the holidays, Gary Shandling died. You remember Gary yeah, Shandling? Sure. He was a, no, a yeah. comedian, actually did the Tonight Show. Oh, yeah, that was a while ago that he died, yeah, though, wasn't it? That's right. It well, they just released the autopsy report, well, and he died of a blood clot. Uh, he apparently was laid out after dental surgery and was not, I, I don't know if there's any blame on the part of the health care provider, don't get me wrong on that, but because he did not, was not mobile after the procedure, he wound up having a blood clot that traveled to his heart and killed him. This is becoming a more frequent episode in hospitals, and hospitals now are charged by the Surgeon General to have specific blood clot prevention programs. and. I think we're going to see into the future more and more of these types of pe these types of 
cases where people either get seriously injured or killed because there was not sufficient blood clot prevention. All right, we, we talked about this last time, and we got to go to the break, but that's something, and you know, if you've dealt with that, you're saying that after having a major surgery or something like that, the hospital is standard procedure now should be giving you an anti-clotting factor. Correct. Not and if they don't, that's not standard of care. That's correct. Not only after <clears throat> surgery, but before surgery, preoperatively, they're supposed to do it. Think of it, think of it, Nick, as like giving you an antibiotic to prevent infection. They give you anti-clotting medication to prevent a clot. Right. And it is proven, demonstrably proven in medical journals that this does prevent, in a lot of cases, a deadly clot. And there are just simply too many people dying in hospitals now who would have survived uh, had they had blood clot prevention. Blood clots are the number one preventable cause of death in hospitals today. On that note, we'll take a break. Listen, the phone lines are open, 737-7587. You want to join in the conversation. Uh, if you've had a situation where you're thinking about it, either someone you know or yourself with a medical procedure that maybe didn't go exactly right along those lines, and we'll go into more other examples. Some of the stories that he and I have done together, actually, I want to get updates from him. But give us a call. Number's open. We'll be back with more. We're going till 9 o'clock right after this. Stay with us.